This is the University of Hawaii Maui College, the college on Maui. Welcome. Welcome to Music 107. Today we're having a special guest, Mr. Roger Steffens, who's going to be Skyping in from his home in Los Angeles around uh, half an hour after the show, after we start, around 12.30. I want to welcome the guests that have come and join us for this uh, open lecture. Uh, I want to propose that we do more of these um, in music so that we can share all the fun and joy. Today, um, in music, uh, in world cultures, we have arrived in sub-Saharan Africa. So we left North Africa uh, and arrived in West Africa. This is where the roots of reggae started long time ago, long, long time ago. And um, our special guest, Mr. Steffens, is an expert on Bob Marley and also reggae. So I want to prepare all of us for this journey to welcome him. All right. Uh, you can also watch this online on the internet, and we have some welcome. We have some uh, rhythm instruments, uh, percussion instruments distributed because I want to uh, show you some of the techniques that are being used. Okay. First of all, if we look up here, uh, I created a special um, special lecture called Bob Marley and Reggae, and you can find this on Lao Lima. And those of you that um, want to have this, and that's not in in my class, you're welcome to email me and I'll be happy to send this to you. Okay, so here we go. We'll um, spend about half an hour talking about some of these basic characteristics, okay, the tradi of traditional African music. And, um, and then we'll go into, uh, we'll Skype Mr. Stephenson. So when we look at um, the, a map of Africa, you see a lot of different countries. But you must realize that these countries are only bounded, bordered by politics, political borders. Okay? You could have um, tribes, okay, the same tribe living in, one in, living in two countries. All right? they, come, they can trace their ancestors all the way back. All right? And Africans, they consider um, your ancestors as alive as you are today. Okay, it's very, very important, this, this concept of the village, your roots, and where they are. You could trace all the way back to one as sister, where they belong. And as some of you might know, there has been um, colonies, for example, the Dutch to South Africa, and then the British, and then you also have the French and the Germans. So many of these European um, languages are spoken today as national languages. Okay, um, something that's very interesting, we here today, we think of going to a concert. You have the musicians performing on stage and you sit in the audience, yeah? Well, traditional African music, you're participating. You are both the audience and the performer. There's no such thing as, oh, let's sit and just watch them. Okay, you participate by taking part in making the music or moving to dance to the music. Okay, that's a very, very important concept. It's, it's something that, um, music is something that everyone does. Okay, and remember when we talk about oral history, how um, it's come, across, come down from generations. It's sung. Okay, it's carried and recorded in music, in songs, all right, and action. Okay, so here we go. Many African languages, and there are hundreds of African languages. They have no separate word for music. Okay, there is a word for song. Okay, and it may mean poetry and dance. Okay, so a musical performance has both singing and dancing. Music without motion is very rare, all right? So the physicality is very important, okay? So here we go. I want to introduce something called the polyrhythm, all right? Here's some of the characteristics. Rhythm is just rhythm, isn't it? Okay, poly means what? Many, many. okay. So we're going to do something 
We did at the beginning of the semester. We'll just do it again. This is the duple against the triple. So polyrhythm means many meters. It could be two, uh, two or three superimposed upon each other. Meter is basically counting the rhythm. All right. So here we'll we'll um, we'll do one, two, three, four, five, six. But I would like this half of the group to put your accent on the one and the three. Okay. And this half of the group, I like you to put the accent on, sorry, one, two, no, sorry, one and the four, and this will be on one, three, and five. So you go one, two, three, four, five, six. This group, you'll do one, two, three, four, five, six, okay? All right, so if you have um, a percussion instrument, do we have more available? You could use that to help you. Those of you that don't, just use your, use your hands and clap, okay? So let's all do the one, two, three, four, five, six together. Just everybody, okay? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, ready? So I'll count, I'll say four, five, six, and then we restart, okay? Four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Good. Okay. So now let's all do the other one. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? Three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. One, two, three, four, five, six. Good. Okay. So are we ready to separate this group? How about this group does it first and you come in with the one, two, three, four, five, six. Okay? And you continue doing that. All right? Okay, four, five, six. One, two, three, 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 four, five, six. happening okay so imagine this was just two rhythms imagine what would happen if I have oh I wish I had another group maybe we could split this how about this group you do the one two three four five six okay but this group I like you to come in a little bit later okay so it feels a little bit syncopation so when they do the one you come in on the two as if it's your one so when you do one, you do one, okay? And you still do the one, two, three, four, five, six. All right, come in. So we continue doing what we're doing, okay? So we'll do, we'll start again. One, two, three, four, five, six. 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 So that was polyrhythm, one example of polyrhythm. It could get really, really complicated. Imagine a set of drums here, another set, another set, and they all come in at different times, and they have to pay attention to the different accents. And you are either participating or you're dancing, and you're hearing all this going around you. All right, very, very exciting. Okay, another one is called um, responsorial forms. This is when I say, Okay, I'm going to do no woman, and you say no cry, okay? No woman. No cry. Okay, that's responsorial form. <laughs> So, no woman, no cry. Okay, so if we sang the whole song like this, that would be responsorial. 
All right. Okay. Um, so what we just did now, if you look on the screen for polyrhythm, was was this was exactly this one two three four one two three four five six and the one two three four five six, and then we tried a little bit of um, this is a different kind where you come in a little bit later. Okay. Now I'm going to introduce ostinato. Who's heard of the word ostinato? Ostinato simply means a repeating pattern. Okay. Um, a repeating pa Do you recognize this tune? Oh, Halloween. <laughs> That's an ostinato. It keeps going on and on and on. Okay. You could have ostinatos in the bass. You could go. It keeps going like. You could do other things on top of it. Okay, that's ostinato. Now, um, today we don't have time to go into the different instruments used in in Africa, uh, but you can imagine there's all sorts of what membrano phones, drums, anything with a membrane skin over it, and idiophones, anything that shakes, rattles. Okay, and there are xylophones and also mbaras, which um, it's, it's a new category. Uh, lamellophones, those are like, um, oh, I don't have a picture here, but you could look it up, yeah. It's like you, you press it, um, it's like a metal that boings and comes out. And then there's also, I wore this today, but it doesn't make any noise, but you can imagine if you wear beads, all sorts of beads, okay? I'm just gonna ask, who's been to Africa and has seen that? Okay, well, if you go there, you'll see people wear beads, okay? They all make noise, so you could have lots of shapes and all sorts of things. So you'll have a constant buzzing and shimmering in the background. Okay. Now, um, gosh, this went really fast. Yes, question. Ostinato. I thought we learned another word, like, in the beginning of the semester for that. Like, Do we? in Canon D. The, where the, the cello just keeps repeating, is that, is that yes. the same? Yes, that's a repeating pattern. Now, ostinato can be both rhythm and tune. So when we talked about the canon, that is an ostinato because it's always like this. Right? It's a steady bass. Even though it's longer. Yeah. Very good observation. So that's a steady bass. All right, so I think we're ready to go into characteristics of reggae. Um, ha some of you might have noticed that I went a little bit crazy yesterday when I discovered, or, uh, discovered a lot of sheet music um, <laughs> on the internet. No woman, no cry. Here we go. This is, okay. And again, those of you that, that, that want this music that's not in my class, you're welcome to email me and I can send it to you. So I looked up on Bob Marley's best hits, top hits. Who knows Redemption song? Okay, All right. I don't have the lyrics here. Um, and then we also have uh, I Shot the Sheriff. <laughs> okay. And Don't Worry, Be Happy. Was that one of his? Okay. And I was surprised that um, Red Red Wine was not Bob Marley's. It was, yeah, can you believe that? I, it's a slow song. It's a slow song. But it, is it reggae, though? It's not reggae? It's not Neil Diamond's version. It's not his version, right? But it, there's a reggae version. Well, I really love this. So do you all know the verse to this? Maybe we could play this. Okay, I'm going to. See, if I do it here, then I can see it from there. Oh, here. Okay. All right. Here's some characteristics of reggae music. First, there's a walking feel. You feel you can walk it. It's almost always the same tempo, yeah? Am I right? Okay. What else? What's a really important point of reggae music? Do I play it like this? No, 
I play exactly on the, the offbeat, the backbeat is called. The, the accent is not on. But, you hear that? Yeah, that makes it the reggae beat. So, oh God, I can't see. That's more like it, yeah? Not like this. Isn't that amazing? It's, the in there, yeah. it's the back beat. It's the beat two and beat four. All right, so. Okay, so it's. How about we clap to this? Um, okay. So, how are you going to do this? Clap on the second beat and the fourth, right? Okay. So, let's sing it. Red, red. Red wine. Okay, there you go. Thanks. So it's the Backbeat, beats two and four, all right? It's got its roots in, um, let's just go to the screen, yeah. Roots in uh, American rock, rhythm and blues, evangelistic hymns and choruses, and we just talked about African drumming and singing, okay? What other, what else is special about reggae music? The harmonies, they're, um, what do you mean by harmonies? Uh, you mean like the, f the type of phonic it is? Yeah, okay, like, you don't hear, you don't hear that, yeah, the dissonant, it's more consonant, that's good. But what about the lyrics? Especially, those of Bob Marley. They're politically motivated, yeah? Socially conscious, yeah? They cause a rise to action. Also love song. What is this? One love, yeah? Okay. Also political. A lot of that, yeah. So, okay. Um, and spiritual. Would you say spiritual as well? Yeah? Okay. So it's not just, oh, it's a kind of music. You describe it melodically, rhythmically, and with harmony. There's a lot more to it. There is the context, the meaning. Yeah? Okay. Dreadlocks. <laughs> Dreadlocks. Um, colors, red, green, and gold, which are from which country? Originally, Ethiopia, that's right, the Ethiopian king went to Jamaica and they thought he was the, the god, the Jah. Okay, there's a whole history of that. So, reference to Jah, and I suppose you all know what ganja is. Okay, <laughs> ganja. All right. Now, all of you have submitted questions for Mr. Steffens, and some of those can be answered here. Um, who was Bob Marley's father? He was a white sailor. He was a white sailor. Good. We could speak into. Yeah, please come in. Yeah. Yeah, come in. Hi. And sing uh, reggae too? Yes. Um, Bob Marley had many children. Yeah. Right. Bob Marley's mother was very young, around 16. Yeah. And uh, Bob Marley's father was um, in his 60s. Yeah. But then he died. So Bob was basically raised by his mother. And then his mother moved to the U.S. And then he stayed back. 
So in 1960, Bob and his friends formed the Whalers. Okay. Rastafari, Rastafarian, this is important. It's a religion uh, that they belong to. And Bob Marley decided he was going to move to the U.S. and follow his mother. But before he did that, he was urged to marry his girlfriend, who was one of the singers, and that's Rita Marley. Okay. And then fr with Rita, he had children. One of them is Ziggy Marley. Who knows Ziggy Marley? Who's heard of him? Okay, so he's a, he's a famous singer. All right. And in preparation for Mr. Seffens to Skype in, I just want to say a little bit about who he is. He, Mr. Steffens, I'll call him Roger, okay, just for short. Roger um, has the world's most extensive collection of Marley's uh, memorabilia, okay. Already, I have the burning question, why? Why have you become a collector? What inspired you to collect, okay? Can I just see a show of hands? Who collects memorabilia? Who collects something? Who collects like CD signed by artists? All right, good. Okay, imagine if you were to become the biggest collector of that artist. What would you have to do? Travel with him, probably, right? Go to all his concerts. Maybe meet his fans and buy the collections from other people in order to get the biggest collection, right? So that I find quite amazing. And then he's also the curator of the world of reggae featuring Bob Marley, okay? 6,000 items, okay, at the Queen Mary in Long Beach. And he's the founding editor of a magazine called the Reggae and African Beat. And there's an annual Bob Marley Collector's um, edition. One of the 10 most influential observer in reggae music. Now, when I was researching into reggae music, I also had to look at music of Jamaica because reggae has its roots in ska and mento. And I found this book here in the public library. All right, call. This is right. The History of Reggae. Now, this is a very simple, easy to read book. It's wonderful. Uh, I haven't checked our library here, but we do have three uh, CDs or DVDs on reggae music. Um, and who's seen the, the two and a half hour documentary, Marley? It's streaming on Netflix. Okay. Roger Steffens was the musical consultant to that movie. And he was in the opening act for the Whalers, 2013 Survival Revival International Tour, and co-author of a book, Bob Marley and the Golden Age of Reggae. And what was it? Scrapbook, silver medal winner, and magazine Best Music Book of 2007, lots of other awards. First place for Best Research, and he's a co-founder of the reggae school in Kauai. Does anybody know about that school, that there's a reggae school in Kauai? I, yeah, I think it would be so much fun just to play music. So uh, let's do another song before um, Roger Skypes in. I'm just going to, do you have it? Uh, should we do No Woman, No Cry? Or let's see, what else do I have? I have Don't Worry, Be Happy. Which one do we want? Who wants No Woman, No Cry? Okay. Who wants Don't Worry, Be Happy? Nobody wants these? Okay. Should we do No Woman, No Cry? All right, let's try that. Okay. This is a little bit difficult because I can't really see this, but I can see it from here. Um... Okay.
Actually, it's better to hear the original. Why don't we do that? <laughs> let's just, let's hear here. Okay, here we go. All right, let's do that. Here's the official video. While this is, by the way, while this is on, I also want to say that you can find out more about uh, Mr. Steffens. If you take a look here, he has a video of his collection and everything, and I'll put that link up too. Okay. Let's try to see what are some of the instruments in the background. Ready to Skype in? Let's try it now. Okay. Video call. So he's oh, wait, we have to save for later. Right. Hello. That's the house. Hello. Roger? Well, let's stick with the subject of retirement conversation. Hi, well, Sparkle can help with my retirement plan, a tool that gives you for retirement. We can do it. Hang on a second here because I'm getting a, a voice over bar. here somehow. Okay. That's, oh, okay. That seems better. Here we go. Oh, wait a minute. <laughs> can I do yeah. whole screen? Let's see. Uh, I'm going to do whole screen. Hi, Roger. Do you see me? I can see you fine, and I see a handsome class of students behind okay, you. Maybe I you could all wave to him so he could see you. Yeah. All right. Um, <laughs> back to the associate attorney general who's been oh, no, responsible man. there. Uh, we have been in Hold negotiations on a with, to be honest, we have been in negotiations with BP. Uh, we have not uh, reached a number that I consider uh, YouTube is still on. Uh, Check my YouTube. Yeah. Uh, I think my YouTube is uh, off. To, uh, uh, I'm going to uh, turn it off. At that time. Um, there are, is the possibility, I suppose, that further negotiation. Okay. Are you on? Okay, now let me. <laughs> I think uh, that. Roger? There yeah, you are. okay, good. Okay. I know, technology is a little bit tricky across the Pacific. Peter Tosh called it tricknology. The tricknology, absolutely. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so um, we have uh, students from my class and also from other uh, Music 107 classes and also other guests from the community, also from the college. Uh, well, let's see. There's been a lot of, um, a lot of questions about Bob Marley himself. I understand he was born in February, February 6, 19, 1945. Uh, he barely knew his father, um, so he was brought up by his mother, who was very young, in Trenchtown in Jamaica. Is that right? Well, uh, that compresses some things. Uh, when his father um, and mother had the child, the father was 64 years of age and his mother was 18. Uh, Norval Marley was basically a dirty old man. He comes from a, a well-connected, wealthy Jamaican white family uh, who had a big construction company that basically built the infrastructure of Jamaica. But he, he was running around making babies all over the island and everybody in the family hated him and he was like the black sheep of the family. So Bob never really knew him. Um, he disappeared after Bob was born, and uh, when Bob was five years of age, he showed up in the village and he said, I want to bring the kid to Kingston with me to give him an education and give him a better shot at life. And his mother reluctantly let him go, and instead of educating him, he sent Bob to live with a, an old woman who was dying, and um, her name was Miss Gray. and. 
it took almost two years before they discovered where he was. And his mother finally came down to Kingston and brought him back to the village. It wasn't until Bob was about 11 that they moved to Kingston. Um, the man we know as one of the original whalers, Bunny Whaler, moved with his father, Toddy Livingston, to the village of Nine Mile when Bunny was eight and Bob was 11. And the, uh, Bob's mother and Bunny's father fell in love and they moved back to Kingston together. But Bob was always uh, prejudiced against by both races. Uh, the, the black race thought he was a white guy. Even his grandmother called him the little German boy at times. And the, uh, you know, the, the white race just looked down their nose at him. Uh, so he, he was really an outcast. And if any of you have seen the film two years ago called Marley, it tells the story of uh, how rejected Bob felt by both races throughout his young life. But it leaves out that absolutely crucial fact of his abandonment on the streets of Kingston when he was only five years of age and basically left to fend for himself and this old woman who was infirm. So that could have turned him very bad very quickly just to survive, but instead it gave him that great empathy that Bob had for the sufferers throughout his life. And um, it, it was a crucial experience of his life, and I was shocked that it was left out of what purported to be a definitive film. So you think that shaped him greatly, this feeling Absolutely. of injustice and feeling of abandonment and being marginalized and not, being, not belonging? The yeah. most crucial event of his childhood, absolutely, without question. Right. right. So he, he desperately wanted to belong. And what turned him to music, actually? Well, when he came back uh, from Kingston at the age of seven, a woman whose palm he had read when, she, when Bob was three and a half and told her the most intimate things about her private life uh, met him at the, the bus and said, oh, you're back, boy. Read my palm again. And he said, no, I don't do that no more. I'm a singer now. <laughs> but I don't think it took it seriously until he moved to uh, Kingston and began hanging around with people like Joe Higgs, who was his uh, earliest and most crucial teacher. <coughs> Excuse me. So we have a lot of questions about Bob Marley, but also about you. Um, well, some of the burning questions we were just talking about is, how did you become such a great collector of Bob Marley's memorabilia? I mean, I presume you also collect other things besides reggae and, and Bob. I mean, you were a collector probably before you even heard of Bob Marley. Is that been right? I've been a collector all my life, and since I was about six years of age when I started collecting stamps and began collecting records when they were still 78s. I don't even know if anybody in your class has ever even held a 78, but they were 10-inch vinyl discs that weighed four or five ounces each, and those were the singles of my childhood. Right. Ooh, what happened here? <laughs> You'd be 45 and 78. Oh. And if you understand those numbers, you're old. <laughs> threes are the albums, 45s are the seven inch singles, and um, 78s were the old, the old one. Well, we do have a record collection in our uh, piano classroom. Um, I don't know what they are. Are they threes? They're just regular records. Yeah, well, the albums are 33s. The, uh, 33. It's revolutions per minute, the, the number of times they turn each minute to play. But I've always been a collector, and I, I was in New York at the birth of rock and roll when the king of rock and roll, Alan Freed, came there, and I used to go to his big shows. I'd, I'd lie and tell my mother I was going to the movies, and I'd take the bus to New York instead, where she was sure I'd be mugged. And uh, I saw Buddy Holly in person in 1957, Teenage Everly Brothers, Jerry Lee Lewis, Fats Domino, Chuck Berry, Bo Diddley, Jackie Wilson, most incredible live shows on, until, you know, the, uh, the late 60s, when the night before I went to Vietnam, I saw Janis Joplin at the Fillmore that just took the top of my head off. So I've always been into music. But by the early 70s, the accountants and the lawyers had taken over the music business. The conglomerates had bought the independent companies, and they, de they emasculated them. And uh, the music turned to a lot of garbage. And it wasn't until 73 that old hippies like me could find a new music that had the, the great harmonies of the 50s doo-wop combined with the great consciousness of the Dylan-esque folk-influenced music of the 60s, and that was reggae. And um, 
I, uh, I read an article in Rolling Stone by a gonzo journalist from Australia named Michael Thomas, who said that reggae music crawls into your bloodstream like some vampire amoeba from the psychic rapids of upper Niger consciousness. And I said, man, I don't know what the heck that means, but I got to find it. I went out that night in Berkeley and I got a used copy of Catch a Fire, Bob's first international album with Bunny and Peter. And uh, I, I couldn't believe how great that was. And the next night I saw The Harder They Come and bought the soundtrack on the way home. And my life has changed in that left-leaning direction ever since. It, it, it has been a, a wonderful 41-year trod that has led to a radio show, a syndicated show on 130 stations around the world, a television show, a magazine that ran for 27 years called The Beat, six books. I've just put to bed my seventh. And um, I've lectured for the past 30 years all over the world, including at, uh, I'm looking at a poster now from uh, the uh, Casanova Club in Makawao, and in Hana Bay a couple of years ago. We did shows there with Marty Dredd, the great singer on, on your island. So um, reggae has taken over my life almost completely. And it was all, an all, all because of a quote, and you were all curious? all because of a quote. Well, tell us, why do you think people like reggae so much? I mean, just on Saturday, I could hear there was a live band at the MAC, the Maui Arts and Cultural Center. They have a lot of reggae bands. I hear that a lot. And even when I was swimming earlier this morning, the lifeguard had a, a radio station on it. They were playing reggae music. I mean, what is it about reggae music that, that people like so much? Well, I'll tell you the secret of reggae and why it has been accepted by people from the outback of Australia to the Himalayan mountains to the Supai Indians and the bottom of the Grand Canyon. The basic beat of reggae music is the healthy human heart at rest. So it has a visceral response in people. It's what you hear in the womb. And you combine that with the consciousness. People know that Bob Marley is a rebel. And young people in particular like that rebellious attitude that he represents. But the head of Amnesty International has said that everywhere he goes in the world today, Bob Marley is the symbol of freedom. And that's pretty astonishing to me. He transcends music in a way that very few other artists ever have. His music stands for something. It means something. It elevates you. In one of his songs, he says, dance to jaw music. And he was asked what that meant. And he said, dance to a music that elevates your soul, that brings you to a higher consciousness. Don't just dance for the sake of dancing. Dance for what he, he told me was head-ucation. <laughs> Not so, jollification, but head-ucation. So there is a lot of depth in this, in reggae music. It's not just the beat, the it sounds good, but there, there's so much content. We were talking about lyrics as well. What made um, Bob Marley's lyrics different from that of other, other reggae composers? Yeah, that's, that's a great question, and I, I think I found the answer. Uh, in, in my new book, This Oral History of Bob Marley, I interview him and a hundred of the people closest to him over the past 35 years, and I ask him all that question. And it boils down to this. Bob Marley was a prophet. And a prophet is somebody who listens to what everybody around him is saying and absorbs it and states it back in a simple way to himself so that he can better understand that. And in so doing, illuminates our situation for all of us. And he made several prophecies in his life that came true. And I'm sure there are still some hidden in his lyrics that we will not see un until future years. But he was an extraordinary human being. He was psychic. He, he channeled Ja. Um, a lot of people say, well, wasn't he just stoned all the time? Well, Bob didn't use herb uh, just to get stoned. He used it to communicate with, with Ja, Jehovah, with Rastafari, with God. And all those great anthems that you sing today, redemption song, get up, stand up, exodus, they were all inspired by his conscious use of the herb. And I think a lot of young people, particularly as herb becomes legalized again, um, respond to that attitude. And if, that's okay. If it gets you into the music and opens your mind to what the message of that music really is, then it's done its job. Well, speaking of um, Bob Marley, he, he knew that 
he was dying. But he, he, knew, uh, he knew that he would die at 36. I've talked to Ibis Pitts and Dion Wilson, two young men in Delaware in 1969 when he went to live with his mother for that summer, that Woodstock summer. He told them in 1969 that he was going to die at 36. And Whoa. he did. How old was he then? 24. 24. He knew he was going to die at the age of 36. Well, it's an odd thing for a young person to be even thinking of, let alone say. But he knew. And that explained, even after the cancer was discovered in uh, the summer of 77, why he, he was so relentless and, and nonstop in touring the world and working night and day because he knew he had only a few years left. Wouldn't you say his death could have been prevented? I mean, oh, cause... absolutely. I mean, if, if you talk to doctors, if he had amputated his foot as they urged him to do, uh, it probably would have stopped the cancer. But you see, when it was discovered, it was already at the third stage. And uh, that's a pretty, pretty critical stage. If you don't act at that point, I mean, the doctors tried to get him to amputate his foot, but, you know, Rastas don't even cut their fingernails. So uh, he, he was, uh, you know, he, he was not listening to the doctor's advice. And Cindy Breakspear, who the great love of his life, Miss World, Damien Marley's mother, uh, told me that, you know, she, she would cook him liver, even though he's not supposed to eat meat, to try to build his strength up. Um, and, and every time she would say, isn't it time for you to go back to your, your regular checkup? He'd say, what, you want me for dead? You're trying to kill me? So he didn't really take care of himself the way he should after that cancer was diagnosed. And he also didn't write a will. I was watching in the movie. Yeah. Rothfuss don't acknowledge the existence of death, and for him to have written a will would have been acknowledging death, and, and he wouldn't do that. But it, it, it left a terrible hole in a lot of people's lives, and it wasn't resolved until 13 years later. Well, tell us more about Rastafarians. I mean, he is, is also having dreadlocks, um, not cutting your hair, another one of those you, you don't cut your fingernail, you don't cut anything. Yeah, that's to be well. That's that's uh, that could take four hours, <laughs> but I won't bore you with all of it. Let me put it this way: um, Leviticus nineteen twenty seven says, "Thou shalt not cut thy hair nor mar the corner of thy beard." Um, it is a Nazarite vow to wear dreadlocks. The Rastafarians believe that Jesus himself was a dreadlock. Um, in nineteen twelve, street preachers in Jamaica started to preached the imminent return of a black king to Africa as a symbol that the day of deliverance or repatriation is near. And in 1930, a nobleman from Ethiopia who could trace his lineage all the way back to King Solomon, named Ras Tafari, which means head creator, was crowned emperor of Ethiopia. And he took the title King of Kings, Lord of Lord, Conquering Lion of the Tribe of Judah, which is prophesied in the Bible. And uh, his title was then changed to Haile Selassie, which means Power of the Trinity. So put them together, you know, the head creator, the Rastafarians say, so who create the head? It must be God. And... Uh, ah, we have a little problem. Sometimes. Yeah. Uh, okay. Dropping gas and uh, poison gas on women and children and trying to take over Ethiopia, the only unconquered uh, uh, country in, in Africa, the only country in Africa that was never colonized. Um, there were pictures in the newspapers in, in Kingston of people in loincloths with long dreadlocks hurling spears at Italian tanks. And these were called Nyabingi men, and Nyabingi meant death to black and white oppressors. So the new followers of this faith called Rastafari in Jamaica adopted the dreadlocks as their symbol as well. And they were outcasts uh, throughout most of their existence. They, they were hunted. They were literally hunted. They were murdered. They, there was almost a genocide committed on them by the colonial authorities and, and by the early stages of Jamaican government, too. Uh, until 1966, when uh, Haile Selassie came to Jamaica and they hoped that he would uh, deny his divinity to his followers, and instead, according to sources who met with him, uh, he said, I am who you say I am. So he kind of turned the tables on them. 
Um, with the rise of the reggae music and the, uh, the great foreign earnings that flooded into Jamaica in the 1970s as these artists got international exposure and success, Rastafarians were accepted by the general society in a much fuller way than they ever had been before. But there's still a lot of resentment in Jamaica for them among the power structure. So that's so interesting. So an outcast becomes a leader. Yeah. yeah? An outcast yeah. becomes a leader. It's Quite not so much a religion as it is a way of life. A way of life. It's a way that understands the rhythm of, 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 the, of nature, of the earth. Uh, was he'd say I'm a farmer and that's where he was raised on a farm up in the bush in northern Jamaica um, people that I've, I've done my life of Bob Marley uh, show for particularly First Nation peoples adapt him as as their own hero uh, the the Maori people in New Zealand uh, called him Redeemer uh, there's a radio station at Uluru, the, the giant rock in the middle of the uh, Australian continent, and it's run by Aboriginal people, and uh, almost every other song they play all day long is Bob Marley because he's so important to them. Uh, the, the Havasupai I mentioned earlier at the bottom of the Grand Canyon think he's the reincarnation of Chief Red Cloud returned to Earth as a black man to lead the red man forward to his freedom again. Um, in, in Kathmandu, there are people who believe he's a reincarnation of the Hindu god Vishnu. So uh, it's, it's kind of an all-purpose philosophy uh, of peace and love and respect and nonviolence, uh, but also you do not allow anyone to give violence to you. Um, it's been adapted by people in virtually every country on earth today as, as a movement for positivity and for consciousness and to recognize the God in all of us. I might also talk about the, the clever use of language that has been invented by the Rastafarians because to them, you and me is a phrase they would never say because you means we are separate from each other. And it goes back to that first book of the Bible, Genesis and the divisionism, the, the illusion of division. So when a Rasta talks to you, he says, yes, I, no, I. It can be very disconcerting at first, because he's talking to himself. I and I, in the Rasta parlance, uh, means you and I, means God and I, means God in I. It is a way of using the language to promote that which is positive and constructive at all times. They will not use the syllable you. They don't go to Maui University. They go to Maui University. And they don't study in the Maui University library because lies lie buried in the library. They go to the true brary. So it, and the most wonderful um, user of that, that uh, language was Peter Tosh, who was a dear friend of mine. And he called his manager his damager. His producer was his reducer. He said he played in San Francisco, California, United States of Asatica, because there's nothing merry about America. It's Asatica. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, <laughs> uh, all right, we have a bunch of questions from everyone. Um, let's see. One qu good question Was Bob Marley motivated more by the music or the struggles of Jamaican people? The music was a tool to illustrate the struggle of the Jamaican people and try to give answers to, to those struggles and solutions to the problems that the oppressors or see it's not oppressors it's downpressors and that's what the Rastafarians would call them downpressors Peter Tosh had a wonderful song called Downpressor Man yeah so it, it, it Bob's whole life was to spread the message of Rastafari throughout the world everything else was secondary the music although that was the tool he used uh, soccer, the women in his life, all of that was secondary. It was to spread the message of Rastafari. Bob never even had a home of his own. He probably bought three or four dozen homes for his band, his baby mothers, his friends, his relatives. He never had a home of his own. He gave away almost all the money he made in his life. He supported 6,000 people a month. Imagine that. 6,000 people a month waited for that check from Bob every month for their very survival in the ghetto. He says, if, if I can't help my people, then my life is without meaning. He was a selfless person. And he was just as happy, you know, sleeping on uh, the, the ground with a rock stone for his pillow. 
he didn't even have a bed. He had a cot until about a year and a half before he died, and some of the women in his life bought him a real bed. Um, he was one of the most amazing people. Uh, he was the artist of the 20th century, the musical artist of the 20th century, and that's just not me saying it. That's the New York Times, which said he was the most influential artist of the second half of the 20th century. The first half, they said, was Louis Armstrong, and they have something very important in common. They were both daily herb smokers. <laughs> go, go figure. I'm not saying. <laughs> do, to what extent do you think... Bob Marley and his band were used by politicians. For example, the Prime Minister of Jamaica invited him to give a concert, and he was troubled by it, and then he asked advice, and someone told him, if you were going to be seen just for him, then you're seen for the country, but if he, the Prime Minister was going to, you know, call an election or going to need you to help gain popularity, then it would be just for him not for the country. And then later on, he was invited to Gabon, and also Zim when Zimbabwe became independent. Well, uh, let's take the, uh, the Smile Jamaica concert first in 1976 when they tried to kill him. Um, it was a concert that was in the works for about six months that was going to be a, like a concert for national unity to have nothing to do with politics. And then all of a sudden, in October of 76, these posters started appearing around Kingston saying that Bob was going to do a concert on the lawn of the Prime Minister's house. And he went to the Prime Minister furious, and he said, I don't want anything to do with politics. You know, he sang, never let a politician make you a favor. They will always want to control you forever. So it was agreed that he could do a nonpartisan show at the National Heroes Park Circle next to the National Stadium in Kingston. And shortly after that concert was announced to be held on December 5th, 76, Michael Manley, the socialist prime minister, announced that national elections would be held 10 days later. And Bob came under death threats almost immediately from the uh, opposition party, from the Jamaican Labor Party. And he was placed under 24-hour guard for weeks. And on Friday night, the 3rd of December, two nights before the concert, Five gunmen broke through the gate uh, after the, the guards had disappeared into the night suddenly and shot five people, including Rita Marley in the head and Bob with a bullet that came across his chest and lodged in his arm. He went to the grave with that bullet in him. And it was proven later that those five men came from the Jamaican Labor Party. And uh, Bob was in hiding after the assassination attempt and his publicist from my Island Records, Jeff Walker, said, you've got to go down and make at least an appearance or else it would be the same as if these men had achieved their purpose in preventing you from doing the concert. And uh, he said, I'm not going down there without a machine gun. <laughs> Jeff Walker, his publicist, said, Bob, your guitar is your machine gun. <laughs> and something snapped and Bob said, you're right, me. He went down and he did a 90-minute set that was the most amazing single moment in 20th century popular music history. And I say that without fear of contradiction. He's standing on stage with a bullet in his arm that was shot into him two nights earlier. His wife has escaped from the hospital. She's got a bullet lodged in her skull and a bloody bandage in a hospital gown singing back up to him. And at the end of his show, he sang a song he hardly ever sang called So Ja Say. And he makes that gesture like he's holding the invisible grapefruit in front of him. And he gets the band, the pickup band of about 20 people to stop playing. And he goes in front of 80,000 people and he goes, if puss and dog can get together, what's wrong with you, my brothers? Why can't we love one another? And that moment, in that context, there's nothing you can compare that to in 20th century music. Woodstock, it rained at Woodstock. People got mud on their feet. You know, that, that to me was just an extraordinary moment. And that was the moment Bob went from showman to shaman. And then in uh, uh, the Gabon concert was January of 80, and he had become friendly in L.A. with the daughter of the president for life, Bongo. Um, and she was having a birthday party in January and invited him to come over and see her country and sing. Uh, he ended up having to sing basically for the king and his cronies, which upset him a great deal. 
And then uh, when Zimbabwe became independent in April of 1980, it was uh, not Mugabe's people, but one of the other uh, rebel groups that invited him to sing at the inauguration ceremonies. And if it is said that Bob was the only performer on the main stage in Zimbabwe's independence ceremonies, it's because he brought the stage with him. They had, they had no infrastructure for a, sh a show at all, so Bob brought stage, lights, sound equipment, spent a quarter of a million dollars of his own money and left all of that behind as his gift to the new country. And that too was, was a, a really great moment as the Union Jack falls over Africa for the final time. The first words in the independent nation of Zimbabwe were ladies and gentlemen, Bob Marley and the Whalers. <laughs> so I have some questions here. Um, um, about yourself, where have you traveled in order to get information about Bob Marley? I think it would be easier to ask where I haven't. <laughs> uh, it's been a 41-year quest um, after reading that article in Rolling Stone, because I've always been a writer and a speaker. I, I keep files on uh, subjects that interest me. Maybe someday I'll write something about this. So I, I got that for issue of Rolling Stone and uh, it came out in June of 73. And I put it in a manila envelope. And now that is the cornerstone of Roger Steffen's reggae archives, which fill seven rooms, floor to ceiling. Uh, I had colonized the entire downstairs, much to my wife's chagrin. There's hardly any room to move. Um, I've gone to Jamaica countless times, interviewed virtually everybody in his life who was important to him. Uh, when people are on tour, I do interviews. When I travel abroad, I, I talked to people who encountered Bob during his many times in England. I've, I've spent a lot of time in England. Um, there's hardly anywhere you go in the world that you can't find some information that, that's useful for a work on Bob. And as I say, I've written six books so far about him and the history of reggae. And um, After 13 years and a computer crash which took my entire manuscript, this is the book. So I, much things to say. Is, is that like a special... So it's the title of one of Bob's songs. Oh, so much things to say, oral history. Yeah. Um, and it'll have 45 color pictures, which I've convinced the publisher to put in, because reggae is so colorful, I want to have that, that bright red, gold, and green attitude throughout the thing. It's full of stuff that nobody's ever heard before about Bob's life from people who've never spoken publicly. And it, it's been a puzzle, too, for me how much to put in there, because I found out the names of the five people who came to kill Bob. And that was 38 years ago, and it would still be very, very dangerous for me to publish those names, even though they're all dead. Did, did, uh, did, did you meet them or interview with them? I'd rather not comment on that. Okay. All right. <laughs> Here, here's, um, so when is your book coming out? When, when is your book coming out? And I hope it'll be out by summer. By summer? All right. Yeah. So, and W.W. W. Norton is the publisher. Uh, is that uh, related to the Norton history of uh, Western Europe? Oh, That's the famous the oldest, Norton, uh, yeah? The oldest independent publisher in America, 163 years of independence. And the vice president of the company, uh, Jim Mars, is my editor. So he's been very patient over the 13 years it's taken me to do this. But it's my magnum opus. It goes along with a, a book that Leroy Pearson and I did called the um, Bob Marley and the Whalers, The Definitive Discography, which is all the, uh, the facts you need to know about everything that Bunny, Bob, and Peter ever recorded. And this is the same uh, format as a college textbook if you were studying Miles Davis or Duke Ellington. It's the only discography, true discography, that's ever been done for any Jamaican artist. Is there a, a book of sheet music of Bob Marley's songs? Yeah. Okay. I, I found a few on the internet, so we were playing that just before you Skyped in. <laughs> um, let's see. Uh, oh, this is a funny one. How many offers? Do you receive a week to sell your items? Oh, uh, per week? Gee, I wish. No, uh, the first offer came from the Schomburg Institute for Research in Black Culture of the New York Public Library, quote, unquote. But it's the major repository of black history up in Harlem. Uh, they tried to buy it in 87. Um, the, uh, 
the Marley family has made several attempts to buy it, but all they want is the Marley part, and that's only 10% of the entire archive, which is the whole history of Jamaican music going back to the 1950s. Uh, and then a Jamaican billionaire named Michael Lee Chin tried to buy it about 10 years ago, but he was going to take three and a half years to pay me, and um, there was no receiving body in Jamaica to receive it, so that didn't work for me. And then um, the Jamaican government itself um, uh, wanted to buy it in 2008, but they, uh, the Minister of Culture laughed in my face when I said it had to be kept intact. And she said, don't be ridiculous, Mr. Steffens. Once it's ours, we can do anything we want with it. And I could see it all on eBay in six months. So it's, not, it's 41 years of my life. It's got to be kept intact, and it's got to be made available to everybody who wants to make use of it while respecting all the artist rights. Those are my bottom lines, and until somebody solves that, I'm going to keep it here. But I'm getting old. I'm 72, and I really want to institutionalize it. Uh, it's an important research, because it, it, it's not just records, it's not just music, it's 140 cubic feet of clippings. Um, uh, there's 1,500 t-shirts, uh, there's 3,000 3, posters, there's, there's 30,000 flyers from all over the world. The head of the Schomburg made me aware that the most important thing to historians is the ephemera. The stuff that's around for a few days, posters, flyers, and then disappears. So behind me, I've got uh, eight file cabinets filled to the brim with, with <laughs> flyers and posters from around the world. My favorite is something I got recently from the Ivory Coast for a group called Negro Muffin. <laughs> and their album, Ja is Life, by Negro Muffin. And there's a, there's a flyer from Israel for the Ganja sound system. It's all in Hebrew with a picture of Golda Meir on the flyer. So, you know, there's, there's some wacky stuff. <laughs> wow. <laughs> uh, and, but uh, is a lot of that memorabilia in archives already in, in published form so people can look at it? Well, uh, the Queen Mary mounted an exhibition of my archives in 2000 that ran for eight months at the ship. And they took 6,000 things out of the house and framed them. Um, the cover of this um, catalog for the exhibition uh, shows a picture I took of Bob that I call the Rasta Thinker, because how many people can you just see the hair and know exactly who it is? And uh, these are, you know, buttons. There's 3,000 buttons. and There's uh, decorations that Selassie wore. And uh, I'd say at least a third of all the albums and records uh, are, are autographed by the artist, so that makes them more precious. Uh, so that's one way. That's on, uh, that's on Amazon. It's called The World of Reggae Featuring Bob Marley, Treasures from, Bob Mar from Roger Steffen's Reggae Archives. But this, this is a great book, too, if I don't mind saying so myself. Uh, Peter Simon, the great reggae photographer, Carly's brother. And I have uh, been collaborating for 30 years. And this is our, a book we did a few years ago called uh, The Reggae Scrapbook. And it's got all kinds of stuff in it that you can take out. And um, let me see if I can find one of the more interesting things in here. It's got posters and cards and backstage. And uh, it's even got stickers. Big people need stickers, too. <laughs> And an hour-long DVD of excerpts from my old television show with a lot of the major artists talking to us. So that book's uh, available on, um, on Amazon, the reggae scrapbook. So there are places you can see this. But, you know, this is just a drop in the bucket. The 6,000 things that they took out for the exhibition at the Queen Mary are maybe 1% of my archive. That's pretty amazing. We, we have a few bizarre questions, and then I'm going to... I'm going to ask the audience if they have other questions. One of them is, um, let's see, did Bob Marley actually write guava jelly while staying on Maui? No. No. Yeah, I, I don't think he... Do you know Barbara Streisand recorded that? Barbara Streisand recorded that? <laughs> yeah. okay. Some of the first real money he made from her royalties. <laughs> right. Because I didn't think Bob Marley came to Maui. Uh, he, yeah, I think he may have on his tours. Did he? Any of you there know for sure whether he did? He did. He did he? come to Maui. Yeah. In the, but he died in 81, though. 
79. On his Far East tour of 79. Far East tour. It was in Lahaina. In Lahaina? In the tennis course? Okay. Um, and uh, let's see. Oh. Let's see. Okay. Have you heard of Catch a Fire? They started off as a Bob okay. Marley tribute band that found okay, yeah, great they're success. Great. They're great. They're a good band from New Zealand. There's a, there's a great band in New Zealand that I really love called Unity Pacific. They're the oldest running reggae band there. And the leader is a little bitty guy called Tingi. He's from the island of Niue, or however you pronounce that. And he's got one long pigtail coming off his chin that reaches the ground. And his son is Che Fu from Fat Freddy's Drop, who is about, I don't know, six foot four and weighs about 300 pounds. <laughs> Not quite sure how that happened. But, but Unity Pacific, that's a great New Zealand band. So now I'm going to open questions to the floor so that I have time to go through the rest. But any burning questions that I didn't cover that you put in? Do you have any questions for Mr. Steffens? I mean, how about the question, what would have happened if Bob Marley hadn't died so young? If he had took care of four, his foot? Yeah. Four years ago, I went, uh, well, I, right above me, I have a Scientific American from 2003, and the cover says, Infinite Earths in parallel universes really exist. Scientific American. So four years ago, on Bob Marley's 65th birthday, I went to Selassieville in Africa in the alternate universe where Bob didn't die, and I interviewed him about his past 65 years. And it was, you know, a kind of a wish list of all the great things that should have or might have happened if Bob had stayed alive. You know, the ultimate reunion at the millennium of Bunny, Bob, and Peter, touring with the Amnesty International tour in 86 when they closed all their shows with Get Up, Stand Up. Imagine if Bob had been there himself to do that as they toured the world. Uh, writing the great free Mandela anthem and singing it to him. Hang on. So this is, uh, this is Bob meeting Mandela as he's released from prison and singing free Mandela to him. That was an illustration for that piece that I wrote, the, uh, the might have been, yeah. Has there been anybody else like Bob Marley? Are you kidding? No. No. You know, is there another Elvis? No. No. No, I mean, who do you compare him to? You've got to compare him to the, the greatest of the greats, John Lennon, uh, Bob Dylan. But how do, you, how do you translate subterranean homesick blues into Urdu? Right. You, can, and you can translate No Woman, No Cry pretty easily. Um, Bob speaks to everyone. He speaks in universal ways. He speaks about all the, the everyday common problems people have and, and shows solutions to them. And he does it in the most eloquent way. Uh, he was a natural poet. He was incredibly handsome. He was very charismatic. Um, I, th there is no comparable figure to him. I mean, everywhere I go, I see people wearing Bob Marley T-shirts. I don't see many Beatles shirts, and I never see a Louis Armstrong. Um, Bob is a figure for the... Okay. Ooh. I think that's a... Okay, we're, we're losing you a little bit. I think we have like one minute and our time is coming oh. to a close. Um, I want to just one last thing is what question do you wish we had asked that you, you would love to answer? I know you ask so many good ones and um, I know that's that's a hard one. I, I, I just uh, urge all of you to to study Bob Marley and and uh, read some of the better books out there. There's a great book if you're interested solely in the music called Wailing so, Wailing Blues: The Story of Bob Marley's Wailers by John Missouri, M A S O U R I, British journalist. It was written with Family Man Barrett, Bob's uh, band leader. And it covers everything they did from 1970 forward, every single song. And you really get an insight into the creative process. And you learn that Family Man and his brother, the drummer, uh, Carly Barrett, who was murdered in 87, were, were the driving force behind all of Bob's international hits and music. And they were really the co-creators, even though they had all their royalties cut off after Bob died.
I'm going to get that from you via email so I could post this to, oh. to everyone that's here. And um, I want to, gosh, I want to thank you, Roger, for taking your time and sharing your vast knowledge and understanding with us. Uh, thank you. Let's wave. <laughs> thank you very much. Nice to be with you today. I hope we can be there in person sometime soon. Absolutely. And I'll send you the link to the recorded version, which will be out later. Oh, uh, good. Thank yeah, you Yeah, so thank you. And One love, everyone. All right. Bye-bye. And you know I'm going to have questions for you for an assignment, right? Those of you that are in my class. Okay. He's still on. Yeah. <laughs> so you'll have to watch this again. Bye-bye. Uh, Okay. All right. Thank you very much for coming to the special lecture uh, on Thursday. We're going to continue with Chapter 6, Music of Sub-Saharan Sub Africa. All right. Thank you. This is the University of Hawaii Maui College, the college on Maui.